Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. The Killer Women Vodcast is pleased to be a part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. To learn more about Danielle and her books, visit her at www.daniellegirard.com and to access all of our vodcasts, go to youtube.com forward slash authors on the air. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Welcome to Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network. I am your host, Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Claire McIntosh. With more than 2 million copies of her book sold worldwide, number one international bestseller, Claire McIntosh is the multi award winning author of I Let You Go, which was a New York Times bestseller, as well as I See You and Let Me Lie. Her most recent thriller, Hostage, was a USA Today bestseller, and the Barnes & Noble, our monthly mystery and thriller pick for March of 2022. Her new mis detective mystery, The Last Party, will be available in the United States on November 8th. Welcome, Claire. Thank you. What an introduction. Thanks for that. I know I fumble over all the words. When I have to read, I can think faster than I can read it, clearly. So... Tell our listeners, which I gobbled this book up, tell our listeners about The Last Party. It is a, um, a detective murder mystery in the vein of a sort of a, a classic murder mystery. So a kind of Agatha Christie style uh, setup. Uh, it takes place on the border between England and Wales around a lake through which the border runs. So on the Welsh side of the lake, is uh, the, the lake is called Clindry or Mirror Lake. Uh, on the Welsh side of the lake is a small rural community, which is also where our detective comes from. And on the English side of the lake is a luxury resort of log cabins, decks stretching out over the water, full of uh, very rich people behaving atrociously. There's lots of tension between the two sides as there often is near a border. Um, and uh, on New Year's Eve, there's a big party at the luxury holiday resort, kind of designed to build bridges between the two communities, uh, but somebody ends up dead. And so on New Year's Day, at the start of the book, we join the story when the locals uh, from this Welsh village are going into the lake for their annual New Year's Day swim, and a body floats through the mist from the English side of the lake to the Welsh side. And from there, it is just every single person you meet is a viable suspect for this murder, which is so fun. Like you said, it's Agatha Christie sort of on like steroids. So it sounds like the um, the inspiration for this book was a little bit personal, right? You, you moved your family um, to Wales. Tell um, our listeners a little bit about sort of where the idea came from, because it's it's so fabulous and vibrant. And I, the lake is such a real place. T talk to us about that. So this felt very different to my other books. So all my standalone thrillers have started with a concept. So they've started with, you know, uh, a, a type of crime or they've started with, um, so with hostage, for example, you know, what would happen if you were on a 20 hour long haul flight and something horrific happened. And this was very different. This started on New Year's Day when I was standing by the lake in our, our small rural Welsh community, uh, which is surrounded by mountains and I was standing there looking at the mist uh, floating on the surface of the water and everyone was shouting happy new year and everyone was saying how incredible this moment was and I was thinking what if a body floated through the water because that's what we do right of course it's, yeah we're walking through beautiful woods and everyone's you know loving the leaves crunching underfoot and we're thinking what if I buried a body like how long before it you know, was discovered or it decomposed. Right. So I was doing that crime writer thing and I went home and I was kind of thinking just about a setting and I've never had a book start with a setting before. So I was mulling over, well, where has this body come from? Who is the body? It's come from the other side of the lake. And this was January 2020. And of course, very shortly after that, the uh, pandemic um 
uh, just changed everything. And borders became incredibly important. And mm -hmm. in the UK, so I, I live um, fairly close to the border with England. And in the UK, of course, we, we operate mostly as one nation, but we are, you know, distinct countries within that. And so suddenly this border between England and Wales became really important because we have devolved uh, authority in health. And so Wales had different rules, different laws to England. You you know, if, if they were in lockdown in, in England, we might not have been in lockdown in Wales or, or vice versa. You couldn't cross the border. You needed, you know, authority. So it was very, very different for us. Right. We're not used to having that type of border that you could previously just kind of, you know, cross when you want. And I wanted to explore that and also explore some of the tensions that I've experienced as an English person moving into Wales. My children are bilingual Welsh English. They're educated in uh, what the Welsh language. Uh, I'm a Welsh learner. So there's, you know, there's a lot going on that I wanted to explore. And because I write crime fiction, you know, and I, I think there is no better genre for exploring society. Yeah. I chose to put this in uh, in a crime novel. And it's not just the border between the two countries and the languages and the sort of, you know, the English, you know, seeming feeling a little bit superior to the Welsh, but also the what the border between wealth, right? The border of the uber wealthy to the to those people, sort of the working class. And that is so such a prominent you know, it's obviously so prominent in our world right now, but it's it's such a, a wonderful um, theme that you you explore in your book. And I have had a, I have really been on like a Claire McIntosh. Um, I have I have splur, I have been splurging all of the Claire McIntosh books all in a row because I was like, you know, because of course I've had this book for I've had I let you go. Um, for those of us who aren't watching me with these beautiful covers. And I was like, I gotta, now that I'm into Claire, I gotta read all the Claire's. Um, <laughs> so I read these almost all three, almost back to back. And I haven't gotten the other two. I'm, you know, I have to take a, take a, a little breather. I don't want really to spoil all my Claire's all at once, but it's amazing. I mean, you're, these books are all so different. So let's talk about that because I mean, each one of them, like you said, it, you know, they, the, all, the real theme amongst them all is sort of this, your detective. There's always a strong detective character. So talk about your own background, right? Because that's the world you come from. Um, but there, but like you said, the books, you really, each one is, is such an, a unique story that, feed, you know, the, and I think one of the things that follows through all of them besides detective is motherhood. So let's talk about first, if you will, your sort of background in as a police officer and how that sort of is, how you transitioned into to writing and, and how that sort of how that, you know, um, oh my God, my brain's kind of not working. How that sort of, you know, affects the way you write these stories. Yeah, I think it has, it, it, it has a huge influence on, on my writing, but not in the way that people think. So when I tell people that I was a police officer for 12 years, I think there is an assumption that I have, um, you know, like a bank of pieces and I, when I want to write a new book, I just sort of flip through this mental <laughs> roller decks of cases and I go, oh, I know, I'll fictionalize that one. And it's really not like that. And it's not like that because actually most real life cases aren't that interesting. You know, most of them are a fairly um, run of the mill. Most criminals are not the moustache twirling, you know, master criminals that we like to read uh, or, or watch on TV. They're, they're pretty stupid that's why they get caught fortunately <laughs> um, but what being in the police force taught me was so much about human nature about the human condition about why we do the things that we do and how we behave once we've done them or once they've been done to us so it is a fascinating insight sort of beneath the bonnet the hood beneath the yeah. hood <laughs> Right, we have um, to translate, yes. Yeah, um, and so, you know, i just sort of give you an example of something that, that changed the way I policed and I think then also changed the way I, I write. So I was a very young police officer and I met um, a, a girl the same age as me who was living on the street. So she was a, a heroin addict and we had both gone to university college 
at the same time and we'd both studied French. So we had this sort of very similar um, uh, background. And then halfway through our degrees, um, her father had died and she had sort of plummeted into this, um, this, this awful state of grief. She didn't have the support that she, uh, that, you know, that she needed and everything started to go wrong and she started taking drugs. And here we were two, three years after that moment and I was a police officer and she was homeless and a drug addict. And actually all that had happened was that her father had died. Um, right. And it just, it was such a sort of, such a simple lesson in teaching me that life is really fragile and that any one of us could end up in a situation you know that that girl hadn't gone she, she hadn't set out in life to commit crimes to take drugs to you know get right. into fights it, it, it was circumstance that had led her to that and so every time I spoke to anyone then whatever their background whatever their their sort of status I just always had that in mind that that you know we're all essentially the same underneath and that any right. of us could find ourselves in a position where we might commit a crime or be victim of a crime right. and my writing now I think the one of the common threads that runs through my books is that question of what makes ordinary people do terrible things right um, and that pretty much crops up in every book I think it does. And in beautiful ways. I mean, I think about, you know, um, hot, you know, the hostage, which is a, you know, a woman uh, uh, who gets on an airplane uh, for 20 hours, no Wi-Fi, and, the, and then her daughter is threatened. And you think about what you would do to save your child. And absolutely. And, and you know, and then every behavior after that, including the, the bad guys in all these books, it's like, you can see a little bit how these things happen, right? I mean, it's a, it's like, you know, it isn't, there is no person in any of the books who is completely evil or completely innocent, right? Including sort of the people that we root for. And in, in the, the thing I just was floored by, and I want to ask about this, I mentioned it before we started, is that they're literally almost without fail, every single person in this book had a reason and a, a good reason to want the the victim dead. And so what I was, you know, when I was thinking about how you pulled this off, because, you know, Agatha Christie often has a closed room mystery and there's maybe a, you know, 10, you know, a dozen people. You have a cast of, I mean, it seems like there's like 30 people in this book who all could possibly want this gentleman dead. So tell us as a process wise, because I'm of course dying to understand it, literally. Um, how do you do this? Do you, is it a map? How are you figuring out each one of these characters? Because you also, they're beautifully drawn people. We're not 30 people, I mean, it's not 30. Do you know how many people are in, like how many points of view? No, no, I, I haven't, but I swear <laughs> every, every time I write a book, I say to myself, okay, keep it small, keep it small. And it just grows and grows and grows. Um, yeah, it, it is. It's a big cast. Um, and I I work really hard in trying to make those voices as distinct as possible. And there are particular ways that I do that, you know, that are different with each book. Sometimes I, I will write in the first person directly to the reader, which is a really good way of instantly getting someone's voice. And if you get their yeah. voice then you know who they are and you're not going to confuse them with with someone else it's much harder to do that i think if you're writing in third person for example yeah. because the reader's doing more work to position that character so yeah it, it is tricky i um i plot and i plan my books like i am investigating a murder uh, it is spreadsheets it's whiteboards it's uh flow charts it's you know it's pictures it's post-it notes it's everything everywhere and I don't write until I've got the whole thing nailed down. That doesn't mean it doesn't change. It doesn't mean that I don't have to throw it away and start again. But I, yeah, I, I planned the whole thing. Um, and with a book like um, Hostage, for example, which took place on an aeroplane. So I had to know where everyone was sitting. Right. And when they moved around, you know, so I had a big cross section, big seating plan of a Boeing 777. I had to know 
where what uh, time zone they were in. So when right. they look out of the window, is it light? Is it dark? Are they over sea or, or uh, land? You know, those sorts of things were, were tricky. The last party uh, is slightly more straightforward in terms of timeline, except that some the first half of the book, some of the action goes backwards and then we go forwards again and we see those scenes mirrored um, back on each other, uh, but with a slightly different perspective. So there's always a structural challenge that makes it interesting to write. I mean, it's that's and talk about that mirroring because that's super interesting, right? So we see that what you you know we see the perspective. We see somebody. A lot of the book happens on New Year's Eve, right? Because that's when that's when the 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 victim dies, and so you have these scenes where you see you see New Year's Eve from one perspective, and then later in the book you see it from a different perspective, which changes, of course, um, the way we see it. And because you're doing this so beautifully, it's really just the character perspective that shifts. Right. I mean, the, the yeah. events that happen are exactly the same as you yes. would expect. Yeah, um, absolutely. And so if you um, uh, if you think of uh, something like The Affair, did you watch The Affair on TV? They, they have these incredible scenes. So you would see the same scene, for example, from a husband's viewpoint and a wife's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And as the viewer you were essentially watching two different scenes and yet it was the same scene. So it's that sort of concept. Um, and it it was inspired by um, something called uh, um, palindromic poetry. So palindrome being a word that you can read from uh, uh, either front or, or back. And palindromic poetry is, um, you, you'll have seen examples online, there are some incredible ones about immigration and self-esteem, all sorts. So you read them from the first line to the last line, and they have one meaning, but then you read the last line, and then you read up, and they have a completely different meaning. Incredible. And they're really cleverly written. And I wanted to, to, I was thinking a lot about the lake and about mirroring, the lake is called Mirror Lake. Um, and as, as you say, these sort of two sides, these, these borders in terms of haves and have nots and culture mm -hmm. and languages um, and the two detectives because it's a cross border investigation. So we have one English detective, one Welsh detective. And, and the idea of a palindrome really seemed to fit with the story that you would see it, you know, one, one version one way and, and then in a different way. Um, and so the, the structure of the book um, sort of does that in in that the first half of the book uh goes from new year's eve when um the party takes place and then works backwards through time to the midway the midpoint of the book which is um when this holiday resort opened so we're kind mm. of at the beginning of the story then and that's when it starts to move forward and yes it's the same um i mean it's it sounds uh, it sounds like it should be repetitive. It's not repetitive because what we're seeing yeah. is um, almost, I suppose, we're referring to the same actions that took place. But because we're in someone else's head and we're getting their backstory and their bias and their, you know, take on everything, it is completely different. And we realize that all those assumptions we made in the first half actually are very different. It's so clever. Exactly. I mean, I, and I think you can, it is, they don't feel like the same scenes at all. Although you write, they're they are, you know, planted in several sort of key lines that you recognize from somebody else's point of view, and yet they're often twisted one hundred and eighty. Because when you see it from somebody else's point of view, it's it's a scene that's that's can mean almost can be the opposite of what we saw originally, and that is amazing. So you say you mentioned that. Um, in your and there's a question and answers which I love at the back of the book. I I, I read I always read that. Um, that you feel like plotting a book is like solving a mystery, a murder in reverse. So when you start the book, do you know who did it? Is that how you? Yeah, I do. Um, but it it often, if not always, changes. So <laughs> I I start off and I know I know how it's done. Um, and I I so the first thing that happened with this particular book, with the last party, was that I knew how the murder had happened. And it was a fun, I mean, you know, fun in any way that, that murder is fun. It was a, 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 an interesting way of killing someone that I really wanted to use. I was quite excited when I uh, came up with this murder method. 
um, Googled a lot to see if it had been done in real life or in fiction, couldn't find it, thought I have actually invented a way of killing someone. It's very and clever. And destroying the evidence yeah. that um, means I could get away with it. So that, that was my starting point. I knew I wanted multiple suspects. Um, and that's partly because it was just that sort of book that, you know, it's a party, there's lots of people that that might have wanted to have done this. But also because crime fiction readers are really clever, aren't they? I mean, they, they just are. better and better and better, all these armchair detectives. And you need to, you know, we, we have to make them work. Um, we, it's, it's a, the whole thing is a game, isn't it? So in, in the book, in, in any of our crime books, it's a, a game of cat and mouse between the, the baddie and the detectives or, you know, the protagonists. But it's also a game of cat and mouse between us and the reader. And absolutely, it's all about the timing of, of information that we're going to allow the reader to get. Um, and I, what I love is if, if the reader comes to the right conclusion, just a split second before it's revealed. That's, yeah. that's, the, the perf that's perfection for me. You know, I want them to feel like they are brilliant, but only for a second before, yes. before you know, I would have told you anyway. <laughs> right. Well, I would say I would very much challenge the reader to guess the end of this book. I mean, that is, and I, as you say, we are savvy. I mean, as writers, as well as as readers, we have seen pretty much, you know, everything done. But as you said, there are, the cat and mouse game you play here is phenomenal. And I'm curious, cause you, I know you mentioned in, in you know, that the, that the whodunit had changed in the second draft. So that's interesting too. You get to the end of the first draft and you're like, this doesn't work or is it like, oh, I have a better way. What, you know, what Yeah, I mean, all, all sorts of things happen with, with different books. Um, I think with this particular book, with The Last Party, the motivation just wasn't quite strong enough mm -hmm. um, with the original suspect. And in the course of having written it, a much better suspect had kind of evolved. And that's the other nice thing about writing a book with lots of suspects is it's actually you don't have to go back and, you know, change the whole story or create a motivation They they did. They do genuinely would all quite like him dead. It's just yes. whether they've got the, you know, the means and the drive and, you know, the opportunity. Um, so I think that's why this one changed. Uh, sometimes it just doesn't work at all um, in I See You. The, again, the character sort of evolved in such a way that they were, that, that the original suspect was just a bit, a bit too pathetic to, to murder someone. I just, you know, they just didn't have it in them. And so I had to go back to the drawing board. Uh, but I always, I always know or think I know at the start who's, who's done it. <laughs> so, uh, so in your process of writing, you know, you, you do this, you know, very specific, very careful plotting, you know, every, you know, you know like you said, flow charts and post-it notes and whiteboards, and then you write the draft and sort of see you know, from that point where things might evolve. Yeah, and then I and then and then I throw it away. <laughs> and then Do I throw it away and start again. Yeah. Yeah. That's which is insane. Oh, it's awful. It's awful. It is. It is utterly, utterly insane. Um it I'm not happy about it. This is this is not, you know, I don't want this to be my process, but it has been my process for every book so far. And I'm on a bit of a mission to change this because it's really inefficient. I basically write two books a year, but only one of them is published. Um, and that is what I've done for the last sort of eight years, um, <sighs> which is, you know, which is ridiculous. Because if you're going to write two books a year, you, you know, at least get paid for them, right? Yeah, um, it's true. But what happens? So, so, for example, with book two in this series, because I will talk about this, I'm sure, but the last part yes. is the start of a series so I'm writing book two and after I wrote the first draft of it um I just came up with a really really brilliant idea for an impossible murder like a, a murder that 
that just or, or an impossible suspect like he, he you know that this this person just could not have done it um and yet they did and once I once I had that idea I couldn't ignore it and it's not right. like I could save it for another book you couldn't save it it couldn't be book three no because it specifically relates right. to the circumstances right. of this particular book and because it was so significant it involved a, a completely new book it, it wasn't a question of just changing the murder or changing the ending or it was a different approach to the same story and the only option was to throw it away and start again um and it's you know it's demoralizing but I can't ignore a much better idea and so far in my my writing career I haven't managed to have that brilliant idea at the beginning I've only ever had it at the end well so so you know I talked to Jillian McAllister about this and she's the same I don't know if you guys have have discussed your this proclivity because it's new. I mean, it's extremely unusual. Do you then? Are you basically saying that you finish the last party and you think, okay, some of this worked, some of it didn't, and you you just start again with a blank screen? You're not working with parts of the book. No, I am. Um, I mean, I don't. You know, I do keep it. It is there, and there will be. Um, it's it's very unusual that the first chapter would change. So generally, the first chapter pretty much stays word for word how it was when I first thought of, you know, when I first started the book. Um, but yeah, every draft will be in a fresh document. And to be honest, I will do that even when I get, say, to the third draft where I'm maybe just doing, I don't know, character edits or I, I'll start a blank document. And I might, at that point, then I might copy and, well, I will be copying and pasting large amounts across. Whereas at the beginning, I'm I'm writing from scratch. Um, and, and very occasionally I'll get to a point where I think, um, oh, this is pretty much the same scene that I had. And then what I'll have is the original document on the left of my screen and the new document on the right. And I'll kind of refer back to it. Mm -hmm. but, but you uh, still but, write it yeah yeah I still write it because writing writing it out creates much better work for me than trying to edit something that's already there you know I, I agree find with that. yeah it, it's a very different example but it's the same principle that if someone were to ask me to write something you know like a I don't know a a, a wedding speech for example I would find it much easier to write it from scratch than to try and edit someone else's work, you know, to, to sort of get the, the flow. And to get that flow, I need that blank page. I need to be able to just create it. There's also, because, of, because I make such extensive changes, there's a high risk that if I worked from an original document, I'd leave what I call um, uh, orphans throughout the book you know things that that related to a different character or an old plot line seeds that don't need right. to be planted now because I'm not going to harvest them in this particular book so it is just cleaner and safer to start from scratch ah so you're I mean so Claire are you writing you know seven days a week 10 hours a day how are you doing this I mean yeah at the moment um yeah I I write um I am writing seven days a week because I'm really behind um, and I'm really behind because I keep throwing books away. So uh, this is why I would quite like to solve my process problem. Um, I, yeah, I've sort of changed my working hours a bit recently. So my husband, uh, six years ago, my husband left work and uh, for the last six years, he's been kind of just the constant at home. So yeah. he dealt with the kids, the domestic stuff, like anything that needed doing, which meant I could just work as much as I needed slash wanted to. And that would be generally at my desk uh, from about nine um, and then staying here till sort of seven in the evening, something like that. But two weeks ago, he went back to work um, which he is saying is a massive shock to the system. Well, I can tell you <laughs> it's quite a big shock to this system too. So now my school, my, my school day, my working day finishes at about 3.30. 
when the kids get home from school because although I'm not doing a school run as any parent of teenagers will know the whole emotional need thing uh, is you know it can be quite intense and actually is is more intense sometimes than the practicalities of you know needing PE kits and shoelaces tied and um, so I find I can't actually write once they're home. Right, right. Well, that's a good segue to motherhood because um, one of the things, and I also, you know, I know you have three children, right? I believe. And yeah. um, and they're all, are they all teenagers? Are they close together? Yeah, I had, um, the, they're all within 15 months. So I've got a 15 year old and then 14 year old twins. Oh, Claire, you crazy lady. <laughs> It was not deliberate, Danielle. What kind of fool do you think I am? <laughs> oh, I know. The twins thing. It's, uh, what a shock to the system. Well, I mean, that, so that is another thing I noticed about your books, which I love because I think, and I, and I, and I also have a very involved, you know, husband and he's fabulous and he's very great with the kids, but there is something about being the mother. And I, there's so many wonderful mother-daughter relationships in the book and actually in all your books. Um, well, not so much mother-daughter, I guess, in the two that I'd read before, but the, but sort of, you know, the being a mother has such an impact on these characters. And I think, I love that. It was so clear to me that there is so much angst, you know, in your, uh, in moving through your brain, not necessarily about your own mothering, but about what it is to be a mother. These women, you know, we fret about our children. And the one, the main character, the Welsh detective, Fion, who's fabulous. From the very moment we meet her, I just think, I'm so glad she's going to be a um, serious character because she is somebody I want to read um, a, a lot about. But anyway, but her, she's moved, she's to, separated, moves back home, and she's a, you know, grown woman whose mother still treats her like a child because that's what we do to our children. So talk about like, you know, your own experience, you know, and you've got wonderful teenage characters. So it's obvious that you've got lots to draw on from home. Although <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure your children are angels in comparison to, to these, but it's like an important theme to you, right? The motherhood. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, I think uh, it, it's not something I set out to write about really. And yet it is glaringly obvious that it, m motherhood is in every single one of my books, uh, like front and center. Um, and occasionally I kind of, you know, expand a bit after the end, which is a non-crime book is very much about parenting. It's a, a, a parent, a, a family drama. Um, but yeah, motherhood, I just, I think it's endlessly fascinated. I'm, I'm fascinated, for example, by things like when you are, um, when you get married or when you're sort of happily um, in a relationship with someone, they are the most important person in your life. And when you have children, you don't, hopefully you don't stop loving the person that you've made this child with, but you love the child more. Right. And so that shift in dynamics is really interesting because you go from a point where, you know, you would do anything to save your loved one to kind of being, well, I, I would, but actually if I had to choose between the two of you, like it would probably be the kid. Um, and and that that shifts in an instant, you know, in right. a heartbeat. So I love, love thinking about that and how that, you know, might might relate to a um a, a novel. Um and and yeah, what you say about um, you know, how Fionn's mum treats her is is so true. Fionn's grown up in this. A uh, very very tight knit small community where everyone knows everyone and they've known each other since they were born basically. And small towns are really interesting because everyone I meet from a small town is sort of conflicted. On the one hand, they love the fact that everyone knows them, and on the other hand, they can't wait to get away and they find <laughs> it really claustrophobic. Um, so she's really sort of torn and can't quite throw off the shackles of who she was as a as a teenager you know everyone still calls her Fion Wicht which means wild Fion um and and she sort of regresses a bit when she's with her mom you know she behaves a bit like a teenager again which I definitely do you know what I Me do too. when I oh. 
I so in my house, I will berate my teenagers for leaving mugs, cups all over the house. I'll have a cup of tea in my mum's house. I will leave my cup on the side. It's it's awful. It's like this weird uh, regression. Um, so yeah, m- motherhood endlessly fascinating, uh, and I can't see me stopping anytime soon. Um, I've um, uh, I I lost a, a child, so we're recording this in uh, October in the UK. Here, it's it's Baby Loss Awareness Week. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, my so I had two sets of twins in 15 months so the first set um we uh I they were born very premature and um when the boys were five weeks old one of them uh, contracted meningitis and and died and so oh, my okay. parenting experience has been complex from the start so it has been mired in grief Um, in grief that was then complicated by a surprise second twin pregnancy um, uh, you know all the sort of postnatal depression that uh, you can imagine was um, a a factor when all this was going on and so a really really complex start to parenting Um, and although you know this is this is what would it be it'll be 16 yeah 16 years ago um it's nevertheless it's I think it made me examine the way I felt about parenting the way I felt about children the um how fragile that yeah. relationship can be you know how how lucky we are and yet how we can also be grateful and lucky and fortunate but also be terribly depressed or grieving of or course. angry or you know it there's so right. many complex emotions and all of that ends up kind of finding its way into my writing somehow which is I mean that's I think as a as a writer and a mother and a you know and a reader reading about the and I'm you mentioned your loss and I'm so sorry in the um in your acknowledgments um of um let you go and I thought you know it's so powerful that we share these stories because I think you know, whether you, it's like you said, we, there's so much to be grateful for. And it's not to say we're not grateful for all the things we have, because we are obviously incredibly privileged. It doesn't take away the, you know, the, for sure, the grief of something like what you've gone through, but even the just hard stuff day to day, right. Of being a mother. And I think by sharing sort of those acknowledging, giving space to the idea that this is a hard job, even yeah. for the luckiest of us, um, I think it's re- it's really a, I think it's something that can help all women, all mothers, and I think it's a gift that that we can give people. So I love the fact that your mothers aren't like they're not the you know on the Oprah stage saying I stay at home, it's perfect, everything's great, you know, <laughs> because I think that's not always realistic. No, it's not, and you're you're right. You know, we have to have these these difficult conversations and to prompt these difficult conversations and that is what we as writers I I I kind of think that's our job you know to to create these discussion starters um which might be about motherhood might be about you know dilemmas about morals uh about you know all sorts of things um our job is of course to entertain but also to hold up a mirror to society and challenge the people looking into it. Absolutely. And one of the things I love that also, you know, just sticking on motherhood for a second, that is sort of to that point is the idea that, you know, we rate, you raise a child, but largely you have so little, I mean, you have some obvious control over sort of how that the way in which they grow up and the morals that you teach them, but you also have less control than you think you might. One, just by their nature. I always thought my children would be like me or my husband, but you know, those are the choices. And yet neither of them is really like either of us. So there's this, you kind of are, you're raising a stranger to some degree, right? And the question is how little we can control and how scary that is that we don't really, we can't, we can't dictate how they turn out. Oh yeah, totally. And then you, you know, if, if we were to explore that further and think about how we, hold parents responsible for their children's behavior you know from when they're little I blame the parents 
And then, you know, what happens if a child, a young adult does something truly horrific, you know, if, if they kill someone, if they set right. fire to a house, how much, how responsible is the parent for that? And how does that parent feel? And are they going right. to carry guilt for that? I mean, it is such, it's such a fascinating subject and that makes it such rich territory for us writers. Especially for thriller writers, right. And then and as you said, like sort of holding the mirror up to society, there's the, this, another theme in the book, which I really love is the idea of redemption. You know, you know, is this, you know, Reese Lloyd, who is the, the victim in this book, um, is, who has done some really, you know, awful things. A number of people in the book have done some kind of not great things, but particularly, of course, our victim, and there's a there's this process that even he goes through in the course of the book, which I find really interesting about, you know, where he might be seeing some of the damage he's done, and is he redeemable? And the question is, do people are people do they deserve a second chance? Do they deserve a third chance? Of you know, at what point do we consider people sort of irredeemable? Yeah, it's it's a tough one, isn't it? I I'm a, a a big believer in second chances and in restorative justice, where you're bringing victims and offenders together and um, enabling offenders to confront the implications of of their actions, um, the the consequences of their actions. I, you know, I th I think that that can really work. Um, I think there are sometimes maybe quite a lot of people who uh, blow that second chance and that yes. third chance, fourth chance. Um, but then equally, I don't think we do a great job in, um, in, in either of our countries, actually, of rehabilitation. You know, I don't think there is enough of a focus on actually trying to understand why things have happened. Um, and if right. you if you just look at the socioeconomic background of most of our uh, inmates in prisons, um, mm -hmm. it, it's fairly clear, actually, that if we addressed the problems around poverty, around racism, around sexism, education, um, yeah, education, that actually we would be reducing our crime rates significantly. So true. It's so true. Yeah. And I love, I love that. I, I'm so, I think as writers too, we're students of this. It's the human nature. It's the system. We have to look at all these things and you, you do a beautiful job of exploring that. Um, I have a strange habit of reading the acknowledgements of a book before I start the book. I'm not sure where that comes from, but I always like to see who, you know, who the author thanks. And one of the people you thank at the end of the last party is Lisa Jewell and you mentioned that it's a, a conversation about um, her advice on research that changed your writing process and of course I'm like well I have to hear about that can you share that we need to yeah know. I can I can uh, I mean I'm you know I'm letting you into the cone of, of secrecy here so grateful uh, circle of trust um so I I was reading a Lisa Jewell book years ago really uh now and um there was just a, there was a tiny point about one of her police officers that that wasn't you know wasn't quite right and I um I dropped her a line and I know Lisa sort of relatively well and I said uh, absolutely loved it definitely you know going to give you a, a a quote if you want one for you know really brilliant book um it's uh, it's obviously still at the advanced copy stage so you know I I if you want I can tell you this minor correction about uh you know how the police operate and she went oh, you're good it's fine and I was like oh okay cool and she said I just never I never do research I you know I'm a storyteller I make things up that's what I do um and I don't know what it was about how she um I mean obviously you know she's phenomenally successful yes it works for her and I just suddenly thought how liberating, how uh, freeing to not be obsessing over, you know, does the number 63 bus actually go from that road to that road? You know, right. uh, does it matter 
yes, there might be two or three people who happen to do that specific job in that specific way and know that specific fact. But actually, we are storytellers. Our job is to create an atmosphere of authenticity where the reader feels as though everything we're telling them is true. It doesn't actually have to be true. God, I love that. That is so funny. I think Harlan Coben says something similar, you know, that just, yeah, he just flies by the seat of his pants. Well, that is refreshingly lovely. I also am, a, I have gotten those, you know, emails where it's like the, the highway is actually, it, it moves north south, but they consider it, you know, they, we refer to it as east west. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, that's really helpful, I guess, for, uh, you know, future reference if I ever refer to that one little highway again. Which I am um, my favorite. So my favorite, favorite reader feedback, um, and quite genuinely, I do love this. Is um, so in Let Me Lie, there is uh, there are two characters playing a game of Scrabble. Do you play Scrabble in in the states? I'm, yes, okay. yes. Um, so there's two characters playing Scrabble, and I have put the uh, the word score in of of their particular go like this is obviously not remotely relevant to the plot it's just a thing that they're doing of an evening and um, a lovely reader wrote to me to point out that I'd actually missed off the fact that it would have had to have crossed either a double word score or a triple word score and so actually the word count was wrong which meant that the other person had, had you know won the game <laughs> okay that is somebody with some seriously spare time because they had to have set up the board don't you think what I, or just like, I don't know, know a lot about Scrabble. Um, but, or, but what I love about it, and actually what I love about all these readers who write to us with these really specific points is like kudos for reading our books in so much detail that you're yes. noticing things like that and you're thinking about them and you're passionate enough about the stories that we've written to write to us to tell us. So, you know. Thank you. That is, <laughs> to all actually, those people. that is so true. And I, I literally just got one the other day about I have a character who cracks her knuckles and she doesn't do it as much in the second book of the series. She's not as main, she's not a, a major character in the second book, but it's funny. This person was like, did she just stop cracking her knuckles? Cause she only does it like twice in the book versus the, you know, in the first book, she does it sort of much more regularly. And I thought, oh no, I, I don't think she stopped. <laughs> it's a, but it's a very, I mean, that's, that is where I, I, my series Bible has let me down because I didn't do a good job of, you know, because you have to keep track and it's fair. And okay, like, well. so, so here is where I need to learn from you, right? So <laughs> I am only on the second book of the series and I, and, and I have struggled because suddenly I can't make stuff up because, you know, you've set things up in the first book. What are the things that I should be thinking about looking out for? Well, like her car, right? Like her Triumph is a very specific car, Fionn's car, and you yes. can't change the color of it or or how poorly it runs unless she gets to the mechanic. I mean, you know, I think it's, <laughs> I think the layout of the town and, you know, um, I mean, Glynis living above that. I mean, some things are going to change, but the heart, like the, I mean, that's the thing I think yeah. a good series. Of, and actually you probably have somebody who's a super fan you could just put it out in the world. Like, hey, if somebody wants to be a super fan and and make a Bible of the last party, I'll send you a signed copy of the next book because people love that. And I know Lisa Reagan. Oh my God, that's genius. She has, and you have, you have a, obviously a ton of very devoted readers. So say, hey, I got a, a challenge. And you'll, what you'll do is you'll get five of them and put them together, Claire, and you'll have a, a series Bible. That's I because, love that. And it'll be better than the one we could create because here's the thing, we know these stories too well that we gloss over things, you know, that are, that somebody else would notice. And so, and like her sister and the red hair and the curls and the, there's a lot of things you just have to, you know. Um, yeah. So, so do that, you have, do you have like a, a written series Bible then? It's just a word document. Which also you want, because you, know, you need to be able to search it, right? If I'm looking for the color of her eyes because I've lost my mind and I can't remember, then you just search, you know. But yeah, I have a word, I have a word document, and clearly, you know, cracking knuckles wasn't in it, and I, I, it's in it now. It's in it now, right? Brilliant. It's in okay. it now. It's in it now. <laughs> um, so speaking of your super fans, um, you have a book club. There's a Claire Macintosh book club. Is that a real thing? And how do we join? Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, it's 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 not Reese, it's not Oprah. Um, it is just Claire Macintosh. But 
the, the way this started was I hated sending an author newsletter. I really hated yeah. it. I hated being like me, 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 me. You I'm know, so I write you. one book a year. Right. I just, I didn't like it. And what I, but I did like the replies that I got yeah. from readers. And what I loved most is when they told me what they were reading. And sometimes I would say what I was reading and sometimes people had read that too. And, and, and I thought, well, that's the bit I want to keep. And so about four years ago, I just, I got rid of, the author newsletter and I set up a book club um, which now has uh, ooh, about 20,000 people on the mailing list. Um, oh, I love and that. A really, really active um, Facebook group with about 9,000 people in and we talk about books obviously all the time and then I pick a paperback every month and we have a sort of a guided read with questions at the end of the month, um, you know, if people want to join in. Uh, and it's lovely. It's really lovely. And it's taken all that sort of feeling of, of like right. ego out. Yeah. So of course, I'll talk about my books. Of course I do. And of course, when it's that time of the year, I am, of course, going to say, please buy my book. Right. But actually, most of the time, it's about other people's books. And I'm much more comfortable that way I I feel that way exactly which is why I do this podcast I love I mean I'm a writer but I obviously only write a book a year as well it but I read all the time and I love I love you know I'm, I'm such an avid reader in fact if I could retire maybe I would just read I have to think about that how that would work but um no I I don't think we could stop writing probably but but that's fabulous okay so it's on Facebook or they can go to your website yeah, they can go to clairemackintosh.com um, and, you know, there'll be a pop up that, that where they can sign up. Um, but it's, yeah, it's very easy to find just by Googling Claire McIntosh Book Club. And Claire McIntosh, C-L-A-R-E-M-A-C-K-I-N-T-O-S-H. Um, just in case somebody wants to spell it. My daughter is also Claire. I love that name. But hers has the French spelling with the I. So yours is the is the English spelling. So tell us, Claire, what is next? Well, we sort of know um, it's another Fionn story. Can you share anything about it? I can. This will be the first time that I've talked about it. Yes. Um, which means that there is no sort of carefully honed pitch. Uh, so Fionn, we're back with Fionn um, and Leo, her English <gasps> counterpart. Um, and they have been summoned to investigate something I don't think I'm going to say what it is yet because I haven't worked out everything um that they they will be spending their time in the mountains this time so uh, the last party is all about the lake the next book as yet untitled that's not what it's called is in the mountains <laughs> above the lake uh, where a reality tv show is being filmed the contestants on this show think that they have auditioned and been selected for a survival reality TV show, but they haven't. This show called Exposure isn't about survival. It's about how far would you go to protect your darkest secret from being exposed by the TV company, by the other contestants. Um, so the crime that happens is within the backdrop of that reality TV show. Ah. Uh. That is so, that is so fun, Claire. Well, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm, and I have, I, Leo, I'm so happy Leo's coming back. So, cause I think at the back of the book, you tell us that you were writing the second Fionn book, but I wasn't sure what we were, you know, what, what was going to happen with Leo. So, and what uh, those two together. Hmm. Okay. But, um, so this is out now. Is it already out in the UK? It is. Yeah. It came out in August, went straight into the Sunday times top 10, which is great. Uh, so I'm excited now for readers in uh, the US and Canada to be able to read it. Oh my gosh, such a fun book. And we can't wait for the next Fionn Morgan book. Check Claire McIntosh out. You are at clairemacintosh.com, which we already went through. And then you're also on Instagram. With an, I'm on Instagram with as Claire Mac writes. I'm yes. on Twitter as Claire McIntosh. Uh, and much to my teenager's horror, I am on TikTok too. I love it. My, I know exactly. All of our teenagers are horrified by that, but you know what? Hey, they should give us some tips and then we'd be better at it. Um, 
This has been so much fun, Claire. I am such a super fan. Like I said, I read, you know, I just devoured. I had a, I had a Claire McIntosh 10 days where I just devoured all these books. And I, I love, I love getting to know you and your books are amazing. And I'm sorry you have to write them twice, but all I can say is I think it might be worth it. <laughs> oh, I love you for that. Thank you. That was such fun. So fun. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Killer Women podcast with my guest, Claire McIntosh. We will see you next time. Bye. Bye.